very warm welcome to the Global Sports Channel today to Mr. Donovan Bailey. Donovan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Um, it's very cold here in Canada. I'm very certain that it's beautiful in Australia. It's, it's a lovely day today. Hey, I just was saying to you off air before we started that I wanted to try and uh, come up with something different because you, you're a man that's been interviewed all around the world by you know hundreds of different people. But um, let me start off with this one. Have you ever been interviewed by somebody who's living on a sailboat before? Um. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's, that, listen. I mean, uh, first of all, I think I think that living on a sailboat uh, definitely embodies complete and total freedom. Uh, but yes, I, I definitely I've been on a sailboat while I've been interviewed, and, and I've certainly been interviewed uh, by a few journalists that uh, choose choose uh, that as their. Um, place of residence. Okay, so I haven't quite cracked it yet, but I'll keep working on it. So you mentioned the word freedom. What does freedom mean to you? Wow. Well, um, you know what? I think that um, freedom actually means the ability to to do what you want, think however you want to think, obviously within the laws, um, achieve anything that you want to do, um, you know, and, and essentially get up every day and be your authentic self. However, that might uh, that might look. I mean, I think that um, uh, complete and total freedom is when you can actually be your authentic self. Um, obviously, with the laws. Do you think a lot of people struggle with being authentic? Do you think it's a hard journey for a lot of people to get to that level? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that. Um, well, well, ultimately, I, I believe that uh, uh, sometimes uh, human beings uh, choose um, jobs. Uh, or choose things uh, that kind of um, imprison them throughout their lives to uh, to, to make um, to, to make qualified decisions that will allow them to be authentic to themselves. So uh, then, what happens in that case is that these people are usually imprisoned by the by the choice they make in employment, mm -hmm. um, and and so those choices. Are, and obviously, you can't. If you can't make money, you can't go anywhere, and you can't do anything. So mm, mm. I think sometimes it's uh, there's a lot of times it's based upon choices that people make, um, you know, in 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 their in their field of study or or field of uh, or field of work. Yeah, that's really interesting, and I guess we've seen that a lot too during the last year of what's been going on in the world um, and how people have been coping and and on some cases not coping with that as well. Let's ask a superstar athlete and a successful person in life how you've been coping in the last 12 months with the crazy world and what's been happening how, how have you been going with it all well you know what's funny i've been i've been very well i mean i think that um you know i always have i mean i don't think that uh, well number one i've been doing well uh but the first thing i must say is uh, you i don't think there's any human beings uh, there's not one person on this planet that uh, was preparing for a pandemic that was going to shut down the entire planet. So let's let's get that out of the way. Mm. Um, but one of the things that I've always done is, you know, I've always surrounded myself with incredible people and a great support system. You know, so um, part of my ethos has always uh, um, always been able to pivot uh, from one thing to another. And because I'm an athlete and I and I, I pivoted from being a banker to an athlete back to a business person, uh, then um, you know, there's. I always have many things in the fire. I guess I'll say. Uh, you know, so a lot of the, the 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 challenges that that most people might face, I did not do that. Mm. Um, the appearances that I had around the world, the speeches that I had around the world, the interviews that I had around the world. Um, you know, it was very strange. But I actually just pivoted from traveling to those venues and sitting down either uh, in front of an audience or. Or, or at a at a at a, at a media house, uh, I just pivoted that to the, to to being online. Mm. Uh, you know, mm. so ultimately, ultimately for me, um, my transition uh, was actually quite easy. I mean, it's boring as hell, and <laughs> you don't get to leave your house. You don't get to leave your house, and you get to dress up. And I come down the hallway to my office. Uh, but yeah, it 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 is it has certainly uh, been not that bad a stretch for me. I mean. I'm certain when I look at and, and I hear about a lot of people um, out there, again, career choices, um, you know, has 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 definitely increased um, the mental capabilities and capacities of a lot of people mm. uh, and, mm. and, and certain jobs 
uh, it's it's been real tough. So mm-hmm. especially the essential workers, for those for all those people, uh, they they will always have my respect and support. But uh, for me personally, my adjustment uh, to pivot back to uh, to the, the things that I do um, hasn't been that bad. So mm-hmm. I'm definitely not going to complain. Yeah, very well said. Um, what would you say to those people out there today who are struggling and finding it difficult to cope with the current situations? Well, I think that you should always try to look at, well, I say to them all, I mean, I, I speak to, I, I do this quite often. I'm, I think that we have to look at, we have to look at the, the you know, um, the, the silver lining. I mean, I think ultimately, um, you know, take the time to um, take an online class, uh, take a time to uh, pick up the phone and call your friends. I mean, I think that we've, we've forgotten that. We've forgotten what it's like to... Um, you know, to pick up the phone, everyone's like emails and texts and stuff. Um, you know, uh, continue to surround yourself with those people that's always going to challenge you to be your authentic self. I think that's so, so important. Uh, and, and so there's so many, and, and so uh, you, there's so many other things. I mean, uh, get some time to exercise. I mean, mm-hmm. if you're in your own space, do a push up and a sit up. You don't need mm-hmm. weights. Mm-hmm. You don't need any of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, so to, again, take some time to sleep. Uh, take some time to eat well, uh, take some time to breathe, uh, take some time to do some exercise. I mean, that's the baseline to you getting up every day and having a positive outlook on life. Yeah, yeah. Very good advice there. Hey, um, I want to read you something a wise man once said, and I want to get your perspective on it. Um, okay. he, he said, follow your passion, be prepared to work hard, and sacrifice, and above all else, don't let anyone limit your dreams. So let's break it down. Sacrifices. What have, what have you had to sacrifice during your career? Oh my God, a lot. I mean, I, I mean, I think that um, you know, leaving Canada to to go to school and train in America. Uh, I had a young daughter. I didn't have that opportunity at that time. I didn't didn't have an opportunity to wake up every day and 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 see that little girl smile. I mean, that's. That, that to, I mean, I think that being a father was, you know, probably the greatest gift that I've ever had. I mean, mm. it's better than any gold medals ever. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I think that one of the great sacrifices was just family. Uh, the great the great sacrifices was just being at home and being around those people. So the very first thing uh, was that. I mean, I definitely had to leave and and go away to train. I mean, I was I was in, I was lived in. I lived in Melbourne to train every three three months every year. So yeah, I mean, had a great time, but I was away from my family. <laughs> and what about sacrificing in terms of friendships? I guess they were also impacted too because of you know you know mobility and moving around a lot. You know, absolutely. There's you know what? Yeah, I mean, you, I, I always speak about um, the great support system that I've had, and what's been fantastic is that. Um, I did sacrifice my family and some of my friends were, you know, they got to grow and become men and successful adults. Um, uh, But I must say that uh, those very support systems, so those very same men and women that were involved in my life, they are still really, really close with me. Mm. You know, so, so I don't really think of that being a sacrifice because I think that, us as us as adults, we do have the ability to control communication. Yep. Um, and so and so with that, uh, the sacrifices that I made, it's definitely family. But and my friends and I didn't do the the mo- a lot of things that we should have done. But we definitely have caught up over the years, especially during the pandemic. Mm. I like that because you've made a uh, a commitment to the connection with people, which is absolutely vital, isn't it? Yeah. What about the other part of that quote in terms of don't let anyone get in the way of your dreams? What dreams have you still got to live in your life that you want to achieve? Well, listen, one, um, I think that you have to be your authentic self and you should not. If And, 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 and if, if your friend or family is not challenging you to be a better person then they shouldn't be your friend or your family so you can actually find you can actually find good people that supports you now i am alive and very healthy uh so the goals that i have are many i mean i do i spend a lot of time you know although i'm in business i spend a lot of time as a philanthropist 
I spent a lot of time giving back. I spent a lot of time motivating the next generation of successful people, not just in sports. So yes, uh, I, I will absolutely commit to and plan on uh, continuing to do those very same things. Nelson Mandela once said, uh, what we do to give to others is how it determines what our life looks like at the end. Do you agree with that? Well, Nelson was a great man. I had an opportunity to meet that great man and every single word that comes out of that man's mouth. Speaking of sacrifices, my God, yeah. um, you know, yeah. like, you know, every single word that comes out of that man's mouth is, is definitely the, um, the incredible depth of knowledge. And if we all listen to him and people like Muhammad Ali, we all will learn and become better people. I finally found something we have in common. I had lunch with Nelson Mandela one day as well. So, awesome. <laughs> so tell us about being in the man's presence, though. When you're in, in the presence of a man like that, there's some kind of uh, phenomenal aura attached to that, isn't there? Well, yeah, you know what? Um, f- first of all, I, I, I got the call. Say, like, hey, come, come and have lunch. Um, very much like uh, meeting Muhammad Ali in 1996 at the Olympics. Um, and, and, and I think that um, the very first thing I can say is that I feel in both situations, I, you do feel like a like a giddy uh, school child, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but then, but then you kind of sit and understand that, um, you know, I'm mesmerized at first, or I guess you're probably the same. You're mesmerized at first, but then you understand that every word, and I mean, I, I, like I try to learn from people, and and you know, you know, so I think about even an interview how one conducts themselves and the, the words that they say. And, 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 and their mannerisms. And so, uh, you know, you, you, I sit and I try to, obs- I, I, I definitely sat and try to absorb every single thing that I could and every word um, had weight. Mm. And, mm. and I understood also that, you know, I was a number one sprinter on the planet, uh, you know, so it was very important for me to use my stage for good because these were people that were, that, that, that had done incredible things in their lives and they um, essentially were being managed or controlled because they were trying to free people yep. with their own free speech. Yep. And, and, yep. And, and they themselves were punished for that. Mm. So, um, so for me, uh, I, I, every word was weighed mm. and, and it was very important for me to understand how blessed I was and, and the fact that, that I need to use um, my space uh, and and my stage uh, for good. I uh, I met the man in a corporate setting, so I wasn't one on one with him, unfortunately. But uh, it was a situation where it identified a person like him who was able to relate to anybody, and there was yes. no no airs and graces about his statue as a person. It was more about the human being connecting with other human beings, and that's what I found so extraordinary about him um, in that presence, actually. Well, you're well. You're correct. And by the way, I met him in a corporate setting. Also, I had dinner with him, but I, but I felt like no one else was there. I was just sitting at his table. I mean, mm-hmm. but I felt like there was absolutely no one there. I mean, I, mind you, I, I in track and field, I kind of feel like you know I'm naked in my living room, yeah. running a hundred meters. Yeah. So, uh, so, but but I'm saying that it's almost the same thing uh, when I had dinner because we were, we're eating and I'm mesmerized and we're having conversations and no one was around. I yeah. couldn't care less. Yeah. what was going on so yeah. so yeah i mean I, I think that um maybe your ability to focus uh, focus and and my own is probably very much in line where if someone is there that's inspiring you then you're going to lock into every word that they say yeah you know you're in presence of greatness when you feel that don't you i think there's a, a something about it well I, absolutely i mean i i you know i i, I kind of related to you know, you know, in the middle of the track in 100 meters, there's this vortex mm-hmm. that's there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, where 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 you know the 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 audience uh, essentially looks like an abstract painting. You know, uh, you know, and, and 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 everything is quiet, and you can hear a pin drop. You know, so so I I I related to something like that when you're you know when you're in the presence of amazingly great human beings. Uh, that's really how I become, anyways. And, uh, you know, th- that's why it is I continue to challenge myself and learn from some of these great and incredible human beings I've met around the world. That's a great analogy. I like that very much. Hey, this interview is about Donovan Bailey. So let's get back talking about him. Um, it's life. life. <laughs> now, a lot of people won't know this, um, particularly listening to my show. Uh, you were born in Jamaica. 
and you're the, you were the fourth of five sons. And uh, how was it being number four? Well, I mean, it's the only time I was ever number four in my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not true. I remember Rome in 1994. Yes. Oh, well, you know, that was that was my learning lesson. Yes. But yeah, listen, I, I um, my family was awesome. I mean, me, we like we talk about support system. My mom, all five foot one of her managed and controlled all of us um and my dad of course was a disciplinarian uh but yeah i mean i great support system my brothers and i all support each other uh both my parents are now gone to heaven uh but uh but but we had it was amazing support system and we all grow up uh to understand that uh anything that you want to do it's well it, it, it's limitless to what it is that you can achieve so we all grew up with that. All grew up with that attitude, and everyone's is successful in their in their chosen field of, of profession. Brilliant. Brilliant. Now let's talk about let's chickens, talk about chickens goats, goats, and pigs, and because you had a big responsibility before you headed off to primary school every day, didn't you? Tell us about that. Wow, you you did some research. That is awesome. Listen, I grew up on a farm. <laughs> I, I grew up on a farm. I grew up on a farm in Jamaica. I was a farmer. I mean, I'm a, I'm a country boy. Uh, you know, so there was there was there was all kinds of animals uh, on that farm. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, plants and 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 fruit trees. Uh, you know, yeah. So you know, I uh, the, the things that I'm spending, you know, thousands of dollars for are called organic food. Now we were actually <laughs> getting that every single day. <laughs> you know, it, it's amazing. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. So I listen. I grew up every single day. Um, you know, we had farm fresh on the plate and, and um, my mom was an amazing cook and, and everything was very authentic. Um, but yeah, growing up like that, I, I kind of understood what hard work meant. Um, I, I also understood what smart work meant, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. and, and more importantly, I understood um, what time management was. Right. Uh, because, because even with the small, tiny responsibility I might have had, you know, as a little boy, I mean, I knew that the, the priorities were for me uh, were education, uh, obviously getting my chores done. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, getting to bed on time it's for me to prepare myself to wake up the next day to go to classes yeah. and be a sponge to learn as much as I could. Now, there's a little voice in the back of my head that's asking me to ask you, did you have a name for your favorite goat? I, I, you know, it's funny. I, I, I don't remember having a favorite goat just because that, that favorite goat might be a meal. Okay. <laughs> fair, fair comment. Fair comment. Now yes. you're known around the world as a Canadian superstar, of course, but how, how important is that Jamaican heritage to you? I would never, ever not talk about being Jamaican because that would be a complete and total disrespect to my family. That, and to my culture, I, I think that it's something I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very proud of. And of course, uh, you know, growing up on an island, one of the things that you recognize is that's a huge part of my own personal confidence and self-esteem. I, I grew up on an island where I saw every single person, whether or not it's the prime minister, lawyers, doctors, everybody looked like me or a shade of me. Mm -hmm. So that allowed me to kind of be very comfortable with anybody in any room, anywhere. You know, so so I would never, ever, never, ever not talk about not talk about being Jamaican. And and one of the great things about Jamaica and Jamaicans is that they would seek me out and they would let me know <laughs> that 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 I'm disrespecting us or all of us. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it is ama is amazing, amazing island, amazing culture, uh, an amazing place. And of course, uh, there's been some. Um, incredible talent out of that little tiny island. I was talking to Michael Freighter the other day and he said, don't let Donovan tell you or forget about his Jamaican heritage, yeah? No, well, listen, <laughs> Michael, another good dude. Yeah, You know, Michael's done so well on on, 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 uh, on the on the track circuit and, and <clears throat> on the relay and also doing some incredible things right now. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. you've got Bolt and Shelly Ann, you, you've got a ton of... I like you got musicians, inventors, you got incredible people there. So, I mean, Michael knows me already. He, I mean, I'll see him in a few months when I go back on the island. But I'm telling you, uh, yeah, I'm very proud to be Jamaican 
uh, you know, just as much as I'm proud to be Canadian. Yeah, brilliant. So when you're when you're in that environment, and because you've come from that environment, what aspirations did you have in the world at a young age? Do you have dreams to take on the world in certain fields? Did you want to be a sports star right from the beginning? I think one of the, listen. I, I think that if you and your audience ever have, have ever have an opportunity, you, you should either watch or, or try and attend uh, the world's uh, most uh, most highly attended a uh, high school track meet in the world. It's called the the boy. It's it used to be boys champs and girls champs. It's now just called champs. Mm-hmm. And and this is where you see nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen year old little boys and girls who will undoubtedly become Olympic champions. And you have to see that you have to listen to the interviews of these kids. Uh-huh. You have to listen to the self-esteem of these kids. So the issue, so, so to your question, the, 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 the short answer is, hell yes, I planned on being like a huge star. What star, what I was going to do, have no idea. Uh-huh. Uh, but, but I think that when you're in an environment where, where, where success is encouraged <clears throat> and is supported, then you can do whatever you want. I mean, there's many of those people that, I mean, again, that's, you can talk to uh, Michael Frader about that. You can talk to Bolt. You can talk to any of these ki- any of these great stars today where, you know, from, like, from your young, they said, yes, man, you're the best or you're great. I mean, like these things are encouraged. Plus, I mean, you have to put the work in too. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of those coaches that are doing their thing. And you, obviously you got your parents that might give you a, a spanking, at least in my day, um, <laughs> when you're not getting things done properly. Yeah. But yeah, um, it, it is. is it, I had great aspirations. I had no idea what it was. It probably changed from you know being a teacher, a coach, a fireman, a lawyer, like every other boy. Yeah. Uh, you know, to sports where I was going to be a cricketer and yeah. footballer, and then you know I was going to be. I'm sure I was going to be all of those things until I settled on the talents that I was blessed with. <clears throat> You've talked a lot so far about the support networks that are around you all your life with your family and, and greater than that. So you must have been given a lot of good advice when you're a young boy. Can you remember anything particular that stands out that someone told you that holds well to this very day? Listen, some of, this, some of the quotes that I do use are, are quotes from my mother and my grandmother. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, 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 and, and, and I, I think that uh, if someone's saying, hey, listen, you know, you ne- I remember my dad said to me, he said, uh, I remember I was nine years old and he said to me, um, you know, uh, I was studying and I was kind of slacking. And he said, are you are you are you studying uh, like you want to get an A or are you just studying to pass? And essentially, uh, you know, he was challenging me then at that age that what I need to do was to act it, breathe it, put my work commitment in. Yep put my focus there, yep. be disciplined and get done. I mean, mind you, this is what I've obviously expanded on as an adult, yep. but that's what he's telling me in my own, in, in, in him speaking to a nine-year-old. You know, so some of and th- these are all the tools I'll speak to. <clears throat> I'll, talk to I'll tell a, a 10-year-old kid this, and, or, or just as well, I'll tell the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Yep. I mean, there's a, whole, there's a whole lot of distractions that allow us as human beings, especially in these days, where you know sound where 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 people are educated and news are distributed with tiny sound bites mm-hmm. uh you know so uh you know it, it's some of the same characteristics uh that i have or that i've embodied are the things that were taught to me by my parents and grandparents or my uncles and aunts uh those are those very same things that i use today and i very and, and essentially i try to pass that on to um, you know the people that either hire me to speak, um, or, or 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 to motivate um, kids or others. Was there an aspect of the journey where your your brothers were rivalry, competition? Were they motivators as well in different ways for you? Well, absolutely. Listen, I, I you know I'm the fourth <clears throat> of five boys, mm. so I'm gonna get mentorship whether I wanted it or not. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean. <laughs> Yeah. You know, that that's just what it is. I mean, you know, hey, if, if I didn't want to do something, that's just too bad. I was going to do it. I was going to get it done. I was, someone was going to drag me by the neck and let me go do it. So, yeah, listen, it's it, and that's what I'm saying to you. It's always good when I speak to people, whether or not they, they I mean, they, I mean, I had the luxury of having, you know, three brothers that was older than me. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, a lot of times uh, and, and, and I do a lot of work. 
um, with mentorship, especially here in Canada um, and also in the Caribbean. Uh, but I think it's always important to have someone who's going to challenge you, not bully you because that's it, that's horrific, mm. but challenge you in a way where you can learn so much about yourself and about about them, about the world or, or the society that you're going to exist in. You know, so those are things. I mean, so I think that mentorship, yes, I think that mentorship is a huge part of it. And I definitely had that with my older brothers. Did uh, your grandparents play a big role in your life? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's our culture. Yeah, it's our culture. I mean, it's 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 uh, it's 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 island. It's island life. So uh, everyone listen, everyone played a big role. I mean, while mom and dad might be might be working, um, you know, the, the, the person left in charge might be grandma or grandpa. So that means that they also have the use of the belt if yeah. needed. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, let's right. change up gears because uh, this month is uh, Black History Month and it's an important time for a lot of reasons. Um, what does this mean to you? You know what? Uh, you know, I, I, I did a speech this morning and I'm going to tell you where it starts from. I mean, I'm one of those people that believe that I'm just making black history every day. Mm. So I think that th that's that's always what that's always what I start with. That's number one. I have to be black, but I believe in success. So that's the that, so these are all, all all number one goals of mine. I think that it's incredible, and we do get to celebrate. There's, there's a month that we get to celebrate and highlight. Uh, black success and black history um, where it's not otherwise taught in school. I'm one of those people that I believe in governance and changing laws and, 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 and voting and all of those things. So I am one of those people that believe that, you know, at some point there will not be a Black History Month, but it will it'll just be education that's taught in school, uh, just like every other culture. I just believe that all cultures and, and 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 the journey of all cultures uh should be taught but black history month is is very good um you know i'm definitely not complaining about that uh but it definitely high and it highlights it highlights the journey of black people but i also but i also believe um i also believe i also believe in um in ensuring that i'm successful at all levels mm. yeah that's at all times that's really good. I like the way that you talk about the evolution of Black History Month and how you see it as being something that has an actual timeline or should have a timeline and it becomes part of our global society. I, I see that Black, Black History Month is now being adopted by other countries around the world. UK and Ireland are getting behind it as well. And I think that, right. I think that's a great thing. But as you say, we should be having it down into the level of schools and education where uh, kids, kids of all color and race are being uh, educated the right ways about it, right? Well, I, that's well, I, well, that's what it is. I mean, it, you know, it, it, it's incredible sometimes that um, it's incredible sometimes that I, I mean, at, at, at this age, I'm still learning things mm. and I'm and, and, and there's new stories. Mm. And, and I and 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 I just, and I just think that we, we should have all this information available for all people to learn. I mean, we need to learn about, you know, you know, everybody. We need to learn the Asians, the Africans. We need to learn about the, the, uh, that, about every single person. And this should be part of our ecosystem. It should be part of education. It should, you should learn that, uh, you know, as the world get to a place uh, where hopefully um, there's equality. Um, I think it's very important for us to, you know, talk about some of the atrocities that happened in the past, um, because if I uh, have that um, uncomfortable conversation until it becomes comfortable, uh, you know, I'm blessed with having, you know, friends of every race, every culture, every creed, you know, so we can talk about everything and mm. and, and we can talk about anything, mm. you know. So I just want to make sure that, the, you know, kind of my life, how I see it, uh, this could be, you know, the life of every single little child that's trying to learn about the very same people that they're going to be playing sports with, that they're going to be working with, that they're going to be, you know, that all of those things. I mean, it's, it's, it's the world we live in. I mean, it's, it's, yep. we live in a place right now that, that's, um, is an incredible melting pot. So, so let's start learning and, and talking, uh, well, learning about each other, talking to each other. I mean, you know, talking with each other, having conversations, uh, you know, and let's not get in this place where one is preaching to another. I mean, yeah, I, I think yeah. it's, yeah. So amazing, so amazing when you can have when you can have dialogue because it's the greatest way to learn about your neighbor. 
Fantastic. And I tell you what, we also should be open to being reflective about that. I'm 56 years old. I'm a very proud New Zealander. But it's only in recent years that I've started to find out about the atrocities that took place in my country around the Polynesian and Maori um, indigenous people. And uh, there's things that I want to go back and educate myself at. And I don't think we can ever stop that learning curve as well, which helps. Well, well, again, that's what I'm saying to you. Think about that. You know, at your age, you're thinking I should I know everything. Yeah. I mean, I should, yeah. I should, you know, but you know what I'm saying? I, yeah. I should know everything about where I'm from and, and my people and, and all the people that are around me, you know? So I, I yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm very certain that you're very, you're very much like me where you're supporting education uh, for everybody, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, at the highest level and, and, and at the start of life, as yeah. soon as you start learning, you should learn about all these things. So, you know, hopefully, um, you know, we we get to that place where 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 we can we can put it in uh, the education system, and we can vote some things into law. Uh, you know, so so this place become even more equal. You know, you know. Let's just let's hope the next time you and I have a conversation next year, there's there be some laws in place. Let's hope you so. know across across the board, so we can uh, you know, so we can say, hey, listen, let's let's talk about having a beer as opposed to. All this other stuff. Touche, touche. Let's get back to the track. And I don't know how many races of yours I've watched over the years, but I can tell you it's a lot, a lot of races. And also a lot of interviews you've done. And of course, 96 you know, always comes up. But there is a race that I want to focus on today because I think it was a more defining moment for you in your life journey as an athlete, but also as a human being. And a large part of the show that I'm doing is I'm trying to inspire and motivate people about the human capacity 1994 rome 100 meters it was some one of the probably best fields ever brought together to run 100 meters at that time and in, in that generation what went on for you what was in your head and what happened in that 100 meters that day well first of all i was very nervous uh, you're talking about rome I was extremely nervous. I mean, I, I, I knew that I was talented enough, uh, but I think that that's just because of this, my coach and clearly I've spoken about the support system. Uh, but lining up uh, in a race, um, I kind of, that race kind of defined me where I understood that um, winning doesn't always mean that you're number one. Uh, I got into a race, um, had the most talented sprinters of, 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 of my generation or of that generation in that race. Uh, very nervous, got in the blocks. Um, if I recall correctly, had a very good start. Probably one of the better ones that I've had. You did, over, yeah. Over you my did. career. Yeah. Um, leading, leading. I mean, I just, this is, this is fantastic. Uh, so I decided that, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, <laughs> lack of focus. Uh, I don't know what the hell I was thinking. It was my, it was my first time in a race with maybe with so much pressure or so much talent. I decided to look over to find out where the, where Carl Lewis or Linford or Frankie or whomever, I, I, <laughs> it was Leroy Burrell, they, this was all a blur. Um, I, and I looked over to find out where these guys were after winning, after leading the race up to about 60, about 80 meters, if I recall. And, and the momentum shift from me looking for not minding my own damn business um, allowed me to not only go, went from first place to fourth place very quickly. <laughs> so the lesson, so the lesson learned from that was one, I was talented enough to be there. Two, I was talented enough to beat the best at the time. And three, I belong. Brilliant. You know, so I, so I, I recognize then it, that, that's when the, the, my moniker came up was it was just I win or I learn. And that was one of those days. That was one of the very first days that uh, both things happened. I learned a lot and I won by now knowing that. I, I am, I am as good or better than all of them, um, you know. So, so, so that was one of the few races that both occurred. I've so, come, winning didn't mean me being number one. I've come up with a quote for you on that particular race, and my nice. qu- and my quote for you is, 
The lane is very narrow, but the track is very wide. Hey, I like that. You like I am, that? I am going to steal that. I, I, <laughs> I am definitely going to steal that. I am going to steal that. And I mean, listen, my, my coach just said, mind your damn business. That's what it is. <laughs> stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Stay in, absolutely stay in your lane. Yeah. Yep. So plenty of people around the world have watched you on television and sitting in the stands like I have at the Olympic Games and watched you. And what I'd really like you to explain to them, if you can, is what is it about the 100 metres that people don't realise when they're sitting in the stands and watching it on television? What is it that makes it so amazingly special? Well, the number one thing is, um, I guess it's the only time in the world that the entire world freezes, right? Mm. The entire world, the entire planet, every single person everywhere want to know the result of that. Um, But I think a lot of times people don't realise... Uh, well, I think that people look at the race and they look at the timeline. Mm-hmm. So the timeline's 10 seconds or less. Yep. That's really what it is. Yep. But it's the complete opposite for the participants. Uh, it, is, it, is, it, it could be hours, days, or months. Uh, you know, at the, end, at the end of the day, when you have one one thousandth of one second to make a mistake, correct it, and move on. Yep. Uh, that's not a whole lot of time. So I think the audience get to see something something spectacular being done in under 10 seconds. But the athletes themselves, it really is in slow motion. You know every single breath you take, uh, you know every single uh, you know body position, you know every single thing about that race. So, so the race is in very much ran in slow motion, very much so especially if you're in the zone. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I, but I, I think that, it, and so it's the complete opposite of what, uh, of what the audience might see. So you talked earlier about, you know, some of your starts weren't the best in the, the world and you were notorious for your top end speed and, and coming home like a gazelle. Were you aware of your, your competitors' strengths and weaknesses as well when you got down into the blocks? Did you know whether they were going to get a good start or they were going to catch up, you know, later on in the race? I knew, yeah, you know what? I think that, um, yeah, I'd be lying if I said I didn't know some of my competitors' weak points mm-hmm. uh, because that's what you do. I mean, that's that, but ultimately, um, professional track and field is very much like golf. Uh, it doesn't really matter what your, it doesn't really matter what your, uh, what your opponents does. Uh, but, but uh, one of the good things about track and field, in a lane, you can capitalize on someone's weak points if you're at your strength at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so I knew for a fact that someone like, for instance, Frankie and um, Otto Bolden were always great, consistent starters. But I also knew all along that my top speed was always, be, always going to be greater than theirs. You know, but I also understood that if I left that too long, then they're going to beat me. Mm-hmm. You know, so 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 at the end of the day, you have to learn about the people. You have to learn about the people uh, that you're competing against and understood what it is that you needed to get done. Yeah, I brilliant. mean, Linford, Linford's race and my race was a, was a tiny bit similar, but I knew that his reaction time was better than mine, but also my top speed was better than his. So I just had to snatch him between 30 and 40 meters and we're good. Yeah, okay, cool. Hey, I asked uh, some of our audience to come up with a couple of questions for you today. So I'm going to ask you a couple of those that I've got. The first one's from a guy called David, who's in North Carolina. And he says, um, with your achievements in 1996 for Canada, did it help to overshadow what happened with Ben Johnson? And it, did it bring Canada's you know, sprinting superstar back to stardom again after what happened with, with Ben? You know what? I think it just changed the landscape. I mean, ultimately for me, if you're running the 100 meters, you're not just representing one country, you represent the sport. So I am the biggest ambassador. So I was representing America as much as, much as I was representing Canada, mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, what you had was the greatest drug scandal in the history of sport at that time, obviously onto Lance Armstrong. Mm. Uh, you know, so my responsibility was not only just to carry Canada, I was carrying uh, the positivity of black men. I was carrying. Um, I was carrying the entire sport. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. So. So. I mean, it was. It, it, and it was always good to know that um, when you're going to do an interview, uh, you can speak positively and become a great ambassador of sport. I mean, Kathy Freeman's a good friend. She. She was one of the greatest ambassadors ever. So I mean, like you know. So she under. So. So I'm saying that we all understood 
and 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 are blessed with the stage that we're given you know so it, it's it, it's always very important to to to, to understand to what to use that space that, that stage for so yeah the ben johnson story is never going to go away with with mm. with uh, with my victory and it was not my responsibility mm. my responsibility mm. as i do today is to do it right mm -hmm. and then teach and share wisdom uh, with those people that are trying to achieve greatness. Yeah, well, well said. And I guess you, what you pointed out there, it's a, a multi-dimensional responsibility. It's not just correct as an athlete, right? Yeah, that's a really good point. Okay, the next question is from a guy called Nick. He's in Sydney in Australia, and he asked you, when you retired from athletics, did you feel as though your best years were behind you or ahead of you? Oh, God, uh, always ahead of me. Mm -hmm. Always ahead of me. I, I believe that. See, track and, for, for me, the, the, the track and field's journey was the track and field journey was over, uh, what, which simply meant that um, I was um, retiring from track and field and sprinting. Uh, but it didn't mean I was retiring from life because what happened was that I retired from that. I went right back to the boardroom and the, the competitive juices were the exact same as if I was in the 100 meter finals. So <laughs> nothing ever changes for me. Yeah. I mean, and, and as an athlete, I'll always be competitive. That's, that's I mean, as, as, a, as a born athlete, uh, I'll, I'll always, I want to be, I will always challenge myself. Yep. I want to be the best person, uh, you know, so if I'm going to be a real estate developer, then I want to be a, a, one of the best ones. Yep. Uh, no different than, than, than when I was competing. Let's talk about that transition because you went from the stock world into athletics and then you went back out into the corporate world. So so coming from the stock world into the athletic world, was, was there experiences and skill sets that you brought into the athletic world? Well, I think it was the same thing. One, I was ready. Um, I don't know what I would have done if I actually went and ran track earlier, mm -hmm. but I was mentally ready. I mean, I, I found out very quickly that I, I wasn't, I really wasn't built to be in an office. I felt I was locked in, you know. So uh, the fact that I I was athletically gifted and, and I and I could transition into being one of the fastest uh, persons in history uh, was a great one for me. Uh, but the same mannerisms that I the same mannerisms and tools that I used in the boardroom uh, and in, in a corporate office are the exact same ones that I used on the track and the exact and, and which which in some ways made it very much easier for me as an athlete to, to, uh, to, to then, uh, to get back to, get back to, uh, the world of sport and to, and to, and to, to transform my life back to being in a corporate world. That wise man I referred to a little bit earlier once said that you don't keep a 600 horsepower car on a cross country, uh, drive, right? You, uh, <laughs> you go flat out. So when, when did you realize right. that you wanted to be the, you know, one of the fastest men in the world and the fastest man in the world? When, when did that realize that you didn't want to run a marathon for athletics? You wanted to do sprints. Well, one, I mean, I think that a 200 meters is way too far to go. <laughs> yeah. Right? That, that, yeah. That's the first thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the hundred, mm. I've, ran, I've ran the 100 meters since I was like six years old. So it wasn't like a new event. And maybe I loved the, like, the glitz and glamour even back then. I mean, I had the real pretty ribbon and, you know, you know I guess I was probably getting kisses on my forehead. <laughs> and I liked that then. Um, I mean, I don't know. But, but yeah, I, I, I think the adrenaline rush and the speed is probably what um, I loved. And, 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 and I think that... Um, you know, thanks to my parents, I was blessed with some incredible genes. So all I had to do is convert that into hard work, listen to Dan Paff, who is my coach. Yep. Um, and, and then, you know, kind of put that all in front of the world, represent Canada very proudly uh, to become the, the greatest sprinter of my generation. A lot of people underestimate that relationship with a coach. Tell us how important it is. And, um, you know, what were what were some of the real key attributes that your coach brought to you as a as a human being first and then as a sprinter well first of all i always think that um a coach a coach is probably the single most influential person in your child's life i'm not even talking i'm talking about more than a parent mm -hmm. uh you know that's why i hold such high standards for coaches and when they do something wrong i want them i want them dealt with right away uh, but a coach is the single most influential person in a child's life because, uh, you know, that a co that person can tell that little mind that they can jump off a building. 
if it's going to make them improve. And that child probably knowing it's right or wrong would probably do that thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think that I think that that's such an important thing. In my case, Dan Paff was one of the smartest was is one of the smartest men that I know. Um, Dan challenged me every day in my workouts and I challenge him every day to write better workouts. Mm -hmm. And so and, and one of the great things about the relationship with him is that no question was a dumb question. I asked him a slow questions and we had dialogue all the time. And if he did not know the answer, he, I mean, remember that I, I grew up in, and as you did, in a time when there was no Google and internet and all that stuff. So Dan would leave practice and probably go to the library and uh, go, to, go to an encyclopedia, you know, Britannica and looking at stuff. And if he couldn't find information on that, he would pick up the phone and call someone in his network around the globe to get me an answer for the next day of practice. Right. So Dan challenged me every day. He challenged himself. He was a constant student as well as the teacher. And so those are some of the mannerisms that I learned from him. And that allowed me to either to, to be a, a great athlete and also an even better man. Brilliant. I'll tell you what, I had coach David Bowden on the show recently. And mm -hmm. I was amazed because after the show went to air, I received about 20 emails from athletes that got coached by him telling yeah. me telling me the influence he had on their lives to make them a better human being. And that was quite extraordinary to, to receive those, those sorts of emails, yeah? Well, that, what I'm saying to you, that defines a coach. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and I think that, that I think it's a great big, I mean, we, we you and I are, uh, you know, are having a conversation and this is through sports. Mm -hmm. I get that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if, if you, if I mean, so what, I mean, I emulate this. So if you speak to Dan Paff has touched a million kids around the world and those people are doctors, lawyers, uh, physiotherapists, like some of the greatest on the planet. And really, we, it's about being in a place where someone's positive and supportive, and then they allow you to get into that mindset that you could be the very best. Now, you might not be, you know, a great jumper or a sprinter or a pole vaulter or whatever, but, you, but, you're, but the influence that he's going to have in the time that you have with him is always going to allow you to learn and become such an incredible human being. So, uh, yeah, a real coach is someone that every person that gets in the environment with that person will improve their life. Yeah, That's brilliant. a coach. Brilliant. Okay, you say we're talking about sports, so let me uh, change that up and we'll change the subject. So I've been a uh, philanthropist for about the last 12 years. Um, I know you're a man that loves to give back and, and make a difference. First question about philanthropy, when did it come on to your radar as, a, as an activity? And um, how did you get started in the world of philanthropy? Well, I got started in philanthropy without knowing that it was philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I grew up in a place called Oakville, Ontario, Canada. It's one of the, you know, per capita, one of the nicest places to live in North America. Uh, you know, and so one of the things that my friends and I used to do when we were about 17 years old is, is to go and, uh, and play basketball in the outdoor court by the YMCA. So come to find out that a couple of the kids that were, that were playing basketball um, were, were part of the Big, sis, big, si, big Brothers um, big brothers, big sisters uh, program. Okay. So these were kids from um, single parent households, and you know people having a rough time, a rough go at it, hmm. as you uh, New Zealand and Australians would say, a rough go at it. Yeah. Um, and 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 so we started just coming to play basketball with it. Like so, we kind of go, okay, well, listen, we need some guys to play basketball with because we want to play basketball. Mm -hmm. So every weekend, we we just. We just went and played basketball with these guys, not knowing that we were mentoring people. Yeah, you know. So and yep. again, it starts from just sports, just us selfishly wanting to play basketball. Yep. To to a point where there was kids coming, uh, and there's kids coming every single weekend, and and some of these are successful people. I mean, some of these people are. We're still in. I'm still in touch with some of these very same people right now, where, you know, you understood that you don't know what someone's life journey is until you have a conversation with them. Yeah. And so it started then. So at 17, I did not know that I was being a philanthropist or I was a, being a mentor then, but that's when it started. Also, one of the things that, you know, my parents always taught us that, you know, if you're blessed, 
then you should also share that blessing. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, from 17 years old, I've been a volunteer at many, many, many uh, charity organizations here in Canada and the U.S. and Jamaica and England. Um, you know, you recognize that when you have been blessed, uh, then you need to continue to pass that blessing. And, and that's really what I continue to do today, uh, yep. you know, from building schools uh, to raising money for Alzheimer's and cancer, uh, you know, and, and partnering with anyone around the world. Uh, you know, for me, it's, it, it's become such a, it's, it's becoming such a selfish thing because at the end of the day, I feel so much like I feel better. Like I'm there and, you know, I'm, you know, like people might think I'm doing something and it looks to them that it's a chore. Yeah. But yeah. Ma I'm like, no, I'd rather be nowhere else than helping these people and, and putting a smile on, uh, on, on, on the faces of kids. I always say this, especially when I work with kids and you think of leadership and mentorship and education. There's a certain light and glimmer that comes onto the eyes of a child. I'm, I'm very certain you have seen this. Uh, there's a there's that glimmer that 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 it almost like the entire world op opens up, and I love that sight. I love the sight of a child, uh, you know, realizing that they can go out on the planet and just crush it. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. The word hope is the most powerful the most world, powerful word in the world, perhaps. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Getting, getting back to philanthropy, I've always said that. Uh, Anybody can be a philanthropist and everybody should be a philanthropist. And we don't, um, sometimes people get a bit confused about the word because they think, well, I have to be like a Bill Gates before I can become a philanthropist. But, you know, you've just identified and shared with us your story about how people can do all the things to give back in a different way. And it's even some of the small things that make the biggest difference, isn't it? Well, it, but no, actually, it is it is these small things that make the greater difference. Mm -hmm. Cleaning up your neighborhood, you know, uh, you know, volunteering at a, at a local shelter, uh, you know, uh, you know, donate to a lo local food drive. You don't have to do anything. Take some stuff out of your cupboard and give it to somebody yeah. um, like stuff that you're not using. <laughs> I mean, they, like, I think that sometimes people people don't really understand how easy this is. I mean, and it does not take a chore. Those are the these if, if every single person on the planet do some little gesture of good, some of the ones that we just highlighted, this world would be a better place. And, and, and in, in trying to eradicate homelessness and hunger, some of the simple things, uh, you know, some of these very tiny, simple things, uh, can, you can push that completely out of the way if all of us just do a little tiny part. Donovan, I've got a, a couple of hot topics I want to cover with you before we finish today. But before we get there, okay. I want to go back to what you said about the 200 meters and how far it was for you to run. I remember a day where you ran pretty well over 150 meters to beat somebody uh, on a TV spectacular. Yeah. Um, Tell us about that, because I, I'm thinking that this is the sort of thing that track and feed field needs today. Innovation, something to spice it up with two big rivals like you and Michael were going head to head over a strange distance. Do you think that's something we need more of today? You know what? Actually, yeah. I mean, that 1997, um, I think that some, a lot of times people call and they want to ask me about the rivalries. First of all, Michael Johnson, and I never had a rivalry. I ran the 100 meters. He ran the 400 a lot. Um, I ran the 200 against him once. He beat me. He ran the 100 against me a couple of times. It wasn't close. So, uh, <laughs> so there was never a rivalry. I mean, but, but I respect Michael. Definitely one of the greatest speed endurance athletes in the history of the world. And also has done great work outside of track and field and post, post track and field. 1997 was incredible. And I think that a lot of people got to understand that it was the first time it was an athlete-owned event. Mm -hmm. So much like you see... Uh, Floyd Mayweather, and you see uh, some of these boxers. I mean, uh, you have to think of the entrepreneurial uh, efforts put on by Michael and myself back then. So it was an athlete-owned event. We actually paid each other more than anyone had ever paid us in one shot. Uh, you know, we had millions of dollars as a as a as a as a winning prize money. You know, so so it was something that was that was fantastic. Also, it was a one-on-one -on -one event. And yes, to your point. Uh, I, I actually, funny enough, got a phone call a couple of days ago and someone had asked me if I was willing to invest again and also 
uh, headline and 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 create the one on one. And I think that it's such an incredible. It's we're in a time right now where you want to get the two best people in everything. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And if mm -hmm. anything was made for TV, it was the 1997 event in Toronto. Yep. And I think that it's something that I'm definitely going to consider. And I'm certainly going to call you to sponsor and to come come aboard and all those things. But I think that uh, having a one on one event is something that we, we it is it is great. It, first of all, it was great for the sport. It was fantastic for the audience, uh, you know, and it allowed everyone to kind of walk away feeling very happy well i'll tell you what i'll play your game because i'm going to stage an event in australia here in front of the sydney opera house a hundred meter sprint in front of the sydney opera house televised to the world and uh i want you involved in some capacity as well so there you go we'll help each other out well uh, hey listen absolutely let's chat for sure <laughs> okay good now the the couple of hot topics that i wanted to talk to you about tokyo olympics um a lot of stuff going on around that at the moment. I've spoken to a lot of athletes who are, to be honest, decimated about the confusion. And you know, am I going to be? Am I going to be in shape? And I'm, I've got an unfair situation because I've been in lockdown for the last six months. And what are your views on Tokyo? First of all, should the games be going ahead? Well, number one, the games are going to go on. Mm -hmm. I think that um, I think that obviously with boxing and and um, with uh, football, basketball, baseball in, in North America anyways, uh, that's really a test run uh, for the Olympics. So we know that the Olympics is going to go on. I feel sorry, I have to tell you, for the athletes because it's such uh, – because I think that the average person doesn't really understand that you are you're training your body to peak, to be at its best at a certain time. And there's been so much confusion with the athletes from last year because it was canceled. Mm. Obviously, rightly so, because it's a pandemic and people are dying. Mm. Okay. But this year, it's going to be tough because there are people that are going to be, this, this, I think it's going to be advantageous for some people. It's going to be advantageous for people who don't, who don't like crowds. Yep. Um, yep. It, it, it might be, it might be advantageous for those people who have great, who are, who are from countries with great funding. Uh, that can allow an, an athlete to train and, and, and with proper nutrition and proper therapy and, and get better. Uh, it'll, it'll be great for those athletes who were injured uh, last year who have, uh, who have gotten better. Do you think it's going to dilute the Olympic Games with not having crowds there and you know athletes, as you say, who might be winning medals that usually wouldn't be winning medals? I, you know what? I think it's going to be helpful. It's going to be helpful to some athletes who um, who have anxiety uh, because of crowds. Um, and certainly it's going to be like a practice to them. We don't know yet uh, what the crowd is going to look like. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously it's Japan and, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, though they, they've been pretty good in controlling the pandemic. Um, so we don't know what that's going to look like yet. But certainly I can't imagine not competing in front of fans. I mean, that's, that, that always was the... You know, that was the extra oomph that I needed uh, to do something spectacular. You know, so uh, I don't, so the, the, I, I, like it's, it's a tough place for an athlete to be uh, right now just because, um, you know, uh, the Olympics this year is going to look like it's never looked mm. like before since mm. 1896. Mm. You know, so, so but, I, but, but here's, there's one thing that I do know. There's going to be an Olympic champion there will be some spectacular performances and I will be watching it. Fantastic. So at the end of the day, and I will be cheering on all those people to get great performances. So for me, as an optimist, I know that there's going to be some incredible things and hopefully we see some world records and, and we see some old stars and we see some new stars. I'm with you on all of that. And uh, yeah, just hats off to everybody that's going to go there and give their best in the Olympic spirit because that's what it's all about. Um, Absolutely. Now, the last one for today is the topic of transgenders in sport. There's been an executive order put down by the President of the United States recently. Um, it's caused a lot of furor online with people talking about this is the end of women's sports. What's your view on the situation with transgenders in sport and how do we move together as a collective society on this issue? Wow, that's dead. That's, so there's the hardest question I've ever been asked on air. Um, okay, so, so I have, so there, there's two, 
so I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm trying to not, I'm trying not to be political. So, uh, so there's, uh, there's two minds of thought that I have for that. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't believe. I, I think that someone's feeling, uh, how they're born, who they love, who they date. I, I don't think that uh, this should be a place that people should debate. I think that's crazy. Uh, however, I do believe that you know, at the highest level, you should have uh, men should compete with men and women should compete with women. Mm, yeah. Okay. Fantastically put. Now, look, but <laughs> b- b- before you go, I want to say something to you, and that is on behalf of all the sports fans around the world that you entertained while you were on the track and the humility that you show off the track. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being a great human being. Well, thank you very much. Listen, it's awesome talking to you guys today. And, and listen, let's let's continue to support each other and do great things on this planet. We will. Thank you, Donovan Bailey. Have a great day. And thank you for being on the show. Safe sailing. Take care of yourself. <laughs> we'll chat soon. Bye-bye. All right, then. What a great man. I hope you enjoyed that conversation I just had with Donovan Bailey. Uh, not only is he a great champion on the track, but he's also a great man off the track doing some amazing things. And we've just made a commitment to each other to do a lot of stuff together and supporting each other on our respective uh, journey. So that, look out for some news in that space coming up shortly. Now, if you haven't checked out all of the other episodes on the Global Sports Channel, do so. We've got the amazing Tasha Danvers, who's interviewing lots of sports stars across all sports. Go to globalsportschannel.com to check those out. If you're a social media person, then hop on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and connect with the Global Sports Channel there. And if you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. Hit the little bell button and you'll be notified every time we drop a new video. And please tell somebody about us um, and our content that is inspirational, motivational, educational. We've got sports people coming up from all over the world. Until then, my name is Mark Philpot. I wish you all a very happy and safe day no matter where you are in the world. Thank you for watching.